Hello and welcome. Last week Phil from Phil's Computer Lab revealed this small project which can help to provide minus 5 volts for systems with power supply units which do not provide such voltage. Phil already showed in his video how the voltage blaster can be used and told a bit of the background story about its development. If you didn't see his video yet, please watch it. I will put the link down into the description. So what is this video about? Well, there were many interesting questions on the comments of Phil's video and I would like to try to answer some of them and give some additional technical insights. This was the first prototype. It looks the same as the final version, but has only slightly different labels on the PCB. Anyway, first of all, short explanation how it works. This is how usual mainboard with ISO slots looks like. The ISO slot, starting with XT, is specified to deliver minus 12 volts on the pin B7 and minus 5 volts on pin B5. All the pins of the ISO slots are connected in parallel, so usually there is no difference between them. That's why the told pins B7 and B5 are also connected with each other between all of the slots. The voltage to these pins comes usually directly from the power supply. Well, but what if you want to use a modern ATX power supply which doesn't deliver minus 5 volts? All the B5 pins in the ISO slots would be just floating, with the result that some of the expansion cards which need such voltage wouldn't work. Well, the idea for the voltage blaster is very simple. Since all the ISO slots are connected with each other, it is sufficient to supply minus 5 volts through one of the slots and all the other slots would magically get minus 5 volt support as well. And where can we get minus 5 volts? Easy, just grab minus 12 volts from the pin B7, send it through a voltage regulator LM7905 and redirect the minus 5 volts output to the pin B5. And here is the voltage regulator itself, and with some capacitors for stabilization and a resistor with LED, because why not, the voltage blaster is ready. And on the back side you even can see the trays coming from the pin B7 going to the voltage regulator and then back to the pin B5. Super simple. So this is how it basically works. Now let's take a look at some questions and statements from the comments on Phil's video. Which hardware needs minus 5 volts at all? Phil showed very nicely how Creative Sound Blaster 2.0 behaves without minus 5 volts support. This card is one of the most famous examples. Interesting enough, CMS part of this card will remain working without minus 5 volts. Only Adlib FM and digital parts of the cards are affected. But there are more examples, like this CPS Sound Blaster 2.5, also known under the name Aztec Sound Galaxy NX2. This sound card also needs minus 5 volts, but in this case everything works at the first glance also without minus 5 volts as long as you don't use it in a Disney Sound Source mode, which this card also supports. Next example, Jazz 16 from MediVision. This card, as well as most of the real Pro Audio Spectrum predecessors, also need minus 5 volts and will not work properly without it. These are only some of the examples. Usually these are sound cards, which need minus 5 volts, but there are also some early network adapters, controllers and many industry cards used for measurements and such things. But how do I know if a card needs minus 5 volts? Well, this is quite easy to find out. Take a look at the back of your ISO card and count to the fifth pin. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If the card has this pin, it will probably need minus 5 volts. However, it is also important that there is a trace going away from the pin, since there are some cards in the wild, like this IDE controller, which do have all the pins, but some pins are not connected to the circuitry. As you can see here, it is just floating. And here is an example of a sound card, which does not need minus 5 volts. It is an Aztec, and on the back side you can see that the fifth pin is missing completely. So this card will definitely not need minus 5 volts to work properly. How do I know if my system supports minus 5 volts? This one is also easy. You can look at the label of your PCU. If you see minus 5 volts there, then you're good. If you watched my Septendi 2020 videos, you will probably remember that for example Tendi 1000 RSX provides minus 5 volts on the mainboard directly and not from the PCU. In such cases, you also can just check for voltage measuring on the B5 pin of your ISO slot. If you need minus 5 volts, just find a PCU with minus 5 volt support. Well, first problem, old PCUs are getting older and unreliable. 
Either you have to maintain it properly and exchange parts, or you have to go with a new ATX PCU. Unfortunately, ATX standards dropped minus 5 volts many years ago, and most of the new ATX power supplies will not have it anymore. Furthermore, there are many other interesting use cases. For example, for a mini retro PC project, I'm using this Pico PSU, which is super tiny and allows to use a really small case. Well, sure enough, the Pico PSU doesn't provide minus 5 volts as well, so voltage blaster could be helpful here as well. What happens if I put the voltage blaster into a system which already has minus 5 volt support? Actually, nothing critical. There can be slight voltage slides due to differences between the levels of the PSU and the voltage blaster, but it will not damage anything. Here you can see me putting three voltage blasters in the same board simultaneously mimic the behavior. However, you still shouldn't do so, and there is no need to put a voltage blaster into a system which already provides minus 5 volts. You need a heatsink to cool the LM7905 voltage regulator. This statement came very often. Many told also that a bigger copper area and SMD type of the voltage regulator would be better to help with the heat dissipation and similar ideas. Well, I am glad to say that you shouldn't be concerned about it. You see, negative voltages were mostly used for signal leveling and seldom to power anything. Would we talk about plus 5 volts and LM7805 voltage regulator, which was often used to power circuits and which was exposed to higher currents, then for sure you would need a heatsink as big as possible. But not in case of minus 5 volts. If you look at the power supply label, you will see that for minus 5 volts, it provides maximum of half an amp. It is just a fraction of what it sends through plus 5 volt rail. During the work on the voltage blaster, I made some measurements with the Sound Blaster 2.0, and the sound card took only about 10 milliamps. This is barely enough to get the LM7905 warm, not mentioning to get it really hot. Here you see a setup which was running now for over two hours playing some music. I can't even feel that the regulator got any warm. It is barely one degree higher than the room temperature. So no worries here. I guess if you have a special case where you want to use multiple cards, which all do use minus 5 volts and all of them are hungry at negative voltage, well, in that rare case you maybe should be concerned. Therefore the PCB already has a hole so you can put some thermal paste under the LM7905 and screw it to the board. The copper area below should be just enough to dissipate the heat. But even if you have such a rare case, I'm really in doubt that you want to go with the voltage blaster anyway. Can I use the voltage blaster in a shared slot? This one is about newer main boards with PCI and ISO slots. Voltage blasters main aim are actually older main boards from the time between 8088 and 486. But as Phil told in his video, the voltage blaster works in any more modern mainboard with ISO slot just as fine. The last PCI slot and the first ISO slots are often called shared. You see the PCI cards are faced down and the ISO cards are faced up. If I put a PCI card into a shared PCI slot, I will not be able to put any ISO card into the ISO slot right below because they would restrain each other mechanically. So it is called shared because of mechanical and not electrical reasons. Usually one of the slots can be used and another is wasted. However, a voltage blaster is so small that you can put it into the ISO slot if your PCI card is not too high. And this way no slots will be wasted. And apropos wasted slots, wouldn't it be better to integrate the voltage regulator into the cable to save an ISO slot? Well, sure, voltage blaster is just one solution for the common problem. It is simple, but unfortunately it blocks one ISO slot. This is something you really have to take into account, but usually you have up to 8 ISO slots on the old main boards, and I almost never had a machine where all the slots were populated. At least one 8-bit slot is always free, but I can imagine that in some cases it could be a problem. Then you will have to search for another solution than voltage blaster indeed. Can you build it for PCI? No, PCI specification doesn't provide minus 5 volts. Why didn't you do it with SMD parts? 
Well, at least for my projects, I always try to do everything with through hole parts, since I want to make it easy to build. I do solder SMD quite often, but I tend to make my projects beginners friendly, so they can be also built by people which are inexperienced in soldering. Am I allowed to build, modify or sell the voltage blaster? Yes, after some discussion with Phil, we decided to release the Voltage Blaster as completely free and open source hardware. Just as Phil already told in his video, you are allowed to do with it whatever you want. How can I order the PCB? You can either go to Phil's page and download the zip Gerber files, or you can go to GitHub project page to release this on the right and download the same archive from there. All you have to do now is to go to your favorite PCB manufacturer and submit the downloaded zip file for the order. So, and this was what I would like to add about Voltage Blaster. I hope I could answer the most important questions. Just as Phil told, we are glad for any feedback and would love to see it running in your retro builds. I would also like to thank Phil for the given opportunity to work together on this tiny project. I guess this was also educational for both of us so it was definitely worth it. If you liked this video, please leave your comments and likes below. And if you didn't like it, well, dislikes. Also, don't forget to watch Phil's video about it if you didn't yet. And that's it for me for today, and I say thank you and goodbye.